We're going to call the meeting to order. <clears throat> and then next up, we've got our Pledge of Allegiance. So. Thank you. All right, and uh, just a, a quick note of thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who participated in putting this meeting together, because I know it's a lot of work, and we come here every year to do it, so it's very appreciated. Also, I'd like to acknowledge John Boston, the director of FCAT, and the staff for recording the meeting. And tonight's sound has been brought to you by the fine folks at Dogwood Audio. So, <clears throat> All right, and uh, next up we have our dedication and in memoriam. And I'm going to turn that over to uh, Nathaniel and then Crystal for those. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? There we go. Um, normally every year it's a little bit of a process for us to figure out who to dedicate the year to. Uh, this year was very easy because Tom made it very simple for us. Uh, Tom started as a select board member in 1999 in the spring, the same spring when I was getting my learner's permit to drive. So that tells you how long that Tom has been working here. Um, I want to personally thank Tom for the mentorship that he offered me last year as his last term and my first, um, and also for all of the guidance and advice that he's given to myself and the rest of the, the members of the of the. Select board, um, it has been invaluable, and we cannot thank you enough for both that and also for your service over the last 24 years. Thank you, Tom. And now I'll turn it over to Crystal for the in memoriam. So this year we've had five Sunderland residents that passed away. Um, I'd like to observe a moment of silence for James Balunis. Um, he was on the Sunderland Fire Department and an EMT. Sandra Balunis, who happens to be James' wife. She was a library trustee and was a teacher here at Sunderland Elementary. Dan Fleming. He served zoning board, firemen association, constable for elections. Um, Albion Kablinski, he was a selectman and was on conservation commission for many years. And Peter Murphy, he was an assistant electric inspector and became the wiring inspector uh, and until his passing this year. Um, a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now next up we've got some introductions. I'm going to try to go through these quickly because uh, there's quite a few, but uh, feel free to stand up and take a bow if you'd like when I call your name. So up front, my, we have myself, uh, Dave Pierce, the moderator. We've got our town clerk, Wendy, right behind me there, and our council, <coughs> David Jenkins, next to Wendy. We've got our select board. We've got Crystal Drake Tremblay, our vice chair, Daniel Murphy, the clerk, and Nathaniel Waring, the chair this year. And we've got our town administrator, Jeff Kravitz, holding up the end down there. And then um, we've got the uh, finance committee folks right over here, or two of them to my left uh, tonight. Thanks. All right, and we also have our... Um, Sunderland School Committee, we've got Greg Gottschalk, the chair, Megan Arquin, Jessica Corwin, Peter Gregarin, and Keith Farland. And this will be Greg and Keith's last term on the school committee, so I'd like to thank you guys both. I appreciate that very much. We've got the Sunderland Elementary School Committee. Oh, sorry, we just did that one. Sorry, we've got the Frontier School Committee, Keith McFarland, Christopher White, Lynn Roberts, and this will be Lynn's last year on the Frontier School Committee. Okay. That was last year. Last year, so Keith is now. When I go through this, okay. All right, I was just told those were the right notes from last year. So, so we've got the Center and School Committee, the Frontier School Committee. We've got the Frontier Union 38 School Administration, Darius Modesto, Superintendent. <clears throat> and 
And we have the um, Shelley Perita, the Director of Business, Ben Barshavsky, the Elementary School Principal. We've got Ricky Martin, the Superintendent, and Russ Cobras, the Business Manager from Franklin County Technical School, also with us. All right, just a, a quick, a few tips and housekeeping items tonight. Okay, sorry. Um, but first I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Wendy to, um, she's gonna read her constable's item. Oh. <laughs> Easier this way. Pursuant to the within warrant, I have notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Sunderland by posting up attested copies of the same at the town office building, the Sunderland Public Library, and the Sunderland Post Office, seven days at least before the date hereof, as within directed. Frederick Laurinaitis, Constable of Sunderland, April 19th, 2024, at 12.36 p.m. Um, and the school committee is uh, Jessica Corwin chairs, Joe Elias, Amanda Wygate, um, Megan Arquin, and Peter Gregarians last year, who has just done a fabulous job on that committee and so greatly appreciated. And um, Keith McFarland moved up to Frontier, and Christopher White, somewhere here, is um, on Frontier, and Joe Elias is the rep from the school committee. Thanks. All right, so just a few uh, housekeeping tips. So um, tonight, you should all have a packet for tonight's meeting. Um, and you should have some voting cards in there. And please make sure you've got those. And if you don't have a packet and cards, you can go up to the front table and get some. So your packet's going to include voting cards that we'll use as visual votes in addition to your voice votes. Yes will be green. No is red. And if you have a question, you can please use your yellow card. And that's not for a, a foul, just in case. All right, and um, let's see. And you can also use that card to wave if uh, somebody's got a question, and then somebody will run over to you with a microphone so we can hear your question. I know we tend to say this every year, but please make sure you use the mic just so that uh, people can hear you, because this is a gym, and the acoustics aren't always so great in here, so the, the microphones really help. And your packet will also include copies of the motion, budget info, and any other additional information for certain articles. So for tonight, during the vote, I'm allowed to declare a two-thirds major uh, vote, but if somebody disagrees the vote, they can, seven people may ask for another vote, and we just ask in this case that you please stand and raise your yellow card and have the tellers, if we need them, count. If anybody has any amendments to any articles tonight, they'll need to be handwritten on a, just a piece of paper is fine, and then brought up to Wendy, the town clerk. And then as usual, when we get to Article 3 tonight, which is the budget, I'll read through each budget sec category, and if you want to put a hold on that category for further discussion or questions, just hold up your yellow card and ask to put a hold on that category. And then I'll, I'll ask after each category if anybody wants to put a hold on that. And then just uh, keep in mind we want to be efficient, respectful of everybody's time, but uh, let's make sure that we want to get folks who uh, get a chance to speak and their input and uh, any questions they may have. And then just as a reminder on the consent articles, those will be uh, articles 13 through 18, and we usually vote those as a single block. And those are basically the articles that allow our town workers to do their jobs every day. So, all right, at this point, I'd like to ask for a uh, motion and a second to dispense with the reading of the motions. All right, all those in favor of dispensing with the reading of the motions? Aye. All those uh, against? All right, thank you. All right, and then uh, one more item uh, I'd like to ask. All right, all right, and that one's uh, passed by majority. Uh, this time I'd like to ask for a motion and a second to allow town officials to speak if they are not residents and to also allow three frontier students Josie Silva, Araceli McCoy, and Himen An to speak briefly about Article 12. Do I have a motion for that? 
All right. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone against? All right. Declare by majority. All right, and now it's time for the actual meeting. All right. We have Article 1. Move that the town to hear the reports of the Board of Selectmen, the Sunderland School Committee, and all the town officers, boards, and committees and commissions. Well, I move we are, move Article 1. Second. All right, all those in favor of Article 1? Anyone against? All right, that one is unanimous. All right, Article 2, move that the town vote under the provisions of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 41, Section 108, to set the salaries and compensation of all its elected officials connected therewith for the fiscal year 2025. I motion we move Article 2. Second. All those in favor of Article 2? All right. Anyone against? All right. That one looks unanimous. All right. Article 3. This is the budget. Move that the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $9,888,642 appropriate, excuse me, appropriate from fund... Comcast Peg Access Fund, the sum of $53,000, appropriate from Fund 610-WWTP, Sewer Fund, the sum of $439,854, and appropriate from Free Cash, the sum of $217,301, for the sum total of $10,598,797, for the town and general municipal purposes connected therewith for the fiscal year 2025, all set forth in a document entitled Town of Sunderland FY25 Town Meeting Budget, on file with the town clerk and posted on the town website. I motion we move Article 3. Second. All right. All those in favor of moving Article 3? All right. Anyone against? All right. All right. So our first category. Sorry about that. We kind of rattled right through that one. So we're going to go back and just go through. We actually voted before we went through that. So let's go back through the items, and I'll go through each category. Our first one is general government. Are there any holds on general government? All right. Our second one will be town buildings. Any holds on that one? Okay. Our third will be police department. Any holds on police? Next one will be fire department. Any holds on the fire department? Next one will be inspectors and other protection. No? Next is highway department. Any holds on highway? All right. Next one is health and sanitation. Any holds on that? Uh, next up is library. Any holds on the library? Next is the elementary school. Any holds on the elementary school? All right. Next category is Franklin County Tech. 
and he holds on that. All right. Almost done with our categories. The next is out of district tuition and transportation, and he holds for that item. David. Frontier. frontier. Let's get Frontier. Protect. Yeah. Protect. Uh, I'll, I'll do it both. Yeah, I'll get Frontier. Thank you. Frontier. All right. Um, and we also have Frontier, and he holds on Frontier Regional. Next item is total benefits and insurance, and he holds on that category. Next is total miscellaneous and reserve funds, and he holds on that. Then we have wastewater treatment plant, and he holds on that category. And then our final one is total uh, debt and interest for the water, debt and interest actually, and he holds on that category. All right. All right. Motion that one or? No Yeah. Okay. All right. So I guess we're all set with the budget then. Do you want a revote? Okay. We'll do a revote. Just that. All right. Do I have a motion for um, Article Three, the budget? Motion to remove Article Three. Second. All, right. all those in favor of Article Three? Thank you. Anyone against? All right. Declared uh, unanimous on that one. All right. Next up we have Article 4. Move that the town vote to transfer the sum of $405,670.63 from the Capital Stabilization Fund. And this one needs to be a two-thirds vote on this one. I motion we move Article 4. Second. All those in favor for Article 4. All right. Anyone against? All right. Unanimous on Article 4. Article 5. This one requires a fourth-fifths vote. This is for a <clears throat> prior illegal bill. Move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the amount of $1,282.97 to pay a prior year legal bill from KP Law PC. I motion we move Article 5. All right. Second. All right. All those in favor for Article 5. All right. Thank you. Anyone against? All right, Article 5 declared unanimous. Article 6, this will be the first of three articles for the CPA. Move that the town vote to appropriate the amount of $177,000, of which $28,000 is from the CPA Historic Resources Preserve, and $148,000, which is from the CPA FY24 Undesignated Fund Balance, as requested by the Sunderland Public Library. Monies will be used for the restoration of the Masonry Foundation and site of the Grays Memorial Library for the purposes of exterior preservation and related work. Said funds to be expended under the direction of the Sunderland Public Library. Does um, anybody want to comment from the CPA at all on that one at all? Or? No? Okay. All right, we have a motion on Article I motion, 6. I motion we move Article 6. Second. All right. All those in favor of Article 6? Right. Anyone against? All right. Article 6 declared by majority. Oh, excuse me, unanimous. Not majority. <laughs> Article 7, this is uh, the second of three CPA ones. Move that the town vote to appropriate the amount of 25000 from the CPA FY24 undesignated fund balance as requested by the town of Sunderland. Monies will be used as part of the local match for a mass trails grant for a feasibility study on the Norwatuck North shared use path proposal connecting Sunderland to UMass and the Whateley Park and Ride. 
said funds to be expended under the direction of the Town of Sunderland and are contingent on getting the Mass Trails Grant. I motion to remove Article 7. Second. All those in favor of Article 7. Yeah, nobody said Does anybody have any comments or questions on that one at all? All right. Okay. Anyone against that one? Article 7. All right, two. Okay. All right, so that one's declared by a majority. And this is, the next one will be Article 8. This is our annual housekeeping for the moving of funds for the, the CPA. Move that the town vote to appropriate or reserve from the Community Preservation Fund annual revenues and the amounts recommended by the Community Preservation Committee for committee administrative expenses, community preservation projects, and other expenses in the fiscal year 2025. Does anybody have any questions on the uh, housekeeping one for Article 8 for CPA? Right. My motion we move Article 8. Second. All those in favor of Article 8? Anyone against? All right. That one is unanimous. Article 9. This is uh, one of two zoning articles that we'll have on the agenda for tonight. Move that the town vote to amend Chapter 125 of the Code of Sunderland, Zoning Bylaws, as set forth in a document entitled Proposed Zoning Amendment, ATM 2024, Battery Storage, on file with the town clerk, with provisions to be inserted shown in underlined text and provisions to be deleted shown in strikethrough text. Do you have anybody from... Um, the planning board tonight, Dana. Hi, Dana Roscoe from the planning board. Um, first, um, thank you to Chris uh, for uh, the article uh, in the recorder this week. Um, I think it's really good uh, that we um, be educated about um, what we're uh, proposing, um, and so I'm super thankful. Uh, that you were able to cover that this week. So this um, proposed bylaw is addressing stand-alone battery storage. So this is a fairly new uh, 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 land use in Massachusetts. And what it is is basically um, tractor-trailer trucks full of batteries buying power from the grid when it's cheap and selling it back to the grid when the prices has gone up. So just transactional buying and selling and storing uh, power can or cannot be associated with solar, large-scale solar development. Does not have to be associated with large-scale solar. So it can be just standalone uh, tractor trailer trucks out in the field full of batteries, buying power, selling power back. So what we're attempting to do uh, with this bylaw is say where you can do it in Sunderland and how you can do it in Sunderland. Um, Wendell approached this by saying you can't do it at all in Wendell. And the Attorney General ruled against that. So, so the idea that we could just say, forget it, you can't do it at all in Sunderland is not an option. We've taken a crack at it. There is no guarantee um, that the Attorney General will approve the way that we have proposed it, um, but uh, we are trying to protect the town the best we can, um, and so we have restricted these land uses to one uh, north uh, east corner of town. Uh, on our zoning map, that 
area of town, which is just uh, east of Cranberry Pond. Um, all of the land in Sunderland uh, on State Route 63 um, is part of the C2, the commercial, the, the second commercial district, and that is the only uh, place in town where these would be allowed. So let me just walk you through um, what we have changed here. We, our existing language says large-scale ground-mounted solar electric installations occupying more than a thousand square feet, up to four acres, meeting the requirements. We've added the words without accessory battery energy storage facilities. So no change there other than, than to say that those ground-mounted uh, that were previously allowed will, will continue to be allowed uh, with a, a planning board special permit or site plan review. The first addition to the use table we have uh, is this language. Large-scale ground-mounted solar electric installations occupying more than a thousand square feet, up to four acres, and meeting the requirements of 125.53 uh, with battery en energy storage facilities will only be allowed in the C2 district. They're, they're prohibited in the VR, in the RR, in the VC, and in the C1. Uh, our next bullet uh, adds the words without accessory built, uh, battery storage uh, to installations that are more than four acres. Our next bullet um, is a, a new language. This is large-scale ground-mounted solar electric installations occupying more than four acres and meeting the requirements um, of 125 uh, with battery energy storage facilities would only be allowed in that C2 district. Our next new language, standalone battery energy standalone battery energy storage facilities up to four acres and meeting the requirements uh, of ground mounted standalone blah 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 would be only allowed uh, in the C2 and finally um, if it's a standalone battery storage facility greater than four acres that would be outright prohibited that would not be allowed in any um, of the zones. The, the language addresses health and safety, it addresses uh, having a bond, uh, it addresses having uh, the units constructed on some kind of foundation uh, that would contain um, any, uh, any potential leak or spill, uh, and the language also uh, deals with um, educating um, the fire department, really that's a huge issue with these, is you can't just go and spray water on them uh, and put a fire out. So um, we're, we're doing the best we can. I just, we, we cannot outright prohibit them, so we are attempting to restrict them, and there is no guarantee um, that we will be successful with this round. We have, I personally have been um, approached by solar developers um, interested uh, in this kind of use uh, in this town. So this this isn't just um, uh, it, 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 it it is a real possibility. Hadley um, is is at their town meeting um, developing a similar bylaw, uh, and they already have uh, a developer lined up, and I believe. Um, that the, uh, the reason that Wendell uh, moved forward with prohibiting it was uh, because one had been proposed. So um, it's likely that one will be developed um, in Wendell. So I, I've said enough. I'll, <laughs> I'll sit and listen to questions. Hi. We've got a question there, and then I'll get to you after. One second. 
Uh, Kim Wisseman from South Main Street. I have a couple of questions for you that you can help me with. One is every town in Sunderland, I mean in Sunderland, in the state of Massachusetts going to be required to come up with one of these, propose one of these zoning board. Okay, so I, I want to know if every town in Massachusetts has to do it if, or if only Western Mass is being targeted. Okay. My other one that I have to do is what are the consequences if we say no? And then the other one I have is do we have any control over where the energy goes from the stored batteries? In other words, can we use it in Sunderland or do we, is it going to be used in Boston? Okay. So for communities that do not have um, a solar bylaw, since this is a use that the Attorney General has ruled that you cannot prohibit, um, I believe the answer to your question is that we would revert um, to the state law regulating uh, the uh, use and location um, of these uh, facilities. So, so that would be much less stringent than what we are proposing. Um, your next question was um, consequences. Do you say no? So, so Ibid, uh, back to my, my original uh, uh, response is that it would revert uh, to state law and I believe that that's the circumstance uh, that Wendell finds itself in. Um, your next question? Right, so, so the, the power, we, there's no way to track those ions, you know, that go in to a battery, that go out to the grid. So, so it, 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 it's, I think it's super unlikely that those, uh, that you are transmitting that power to Boston. I, I think, it, practic practically speaking, it's going to be used by WEMCO uh, in, in Western Mass, but uh, we have no way to, I don't think anyone has any way to track where, where that power goes. Thanks. We have one more question over there. Yep. Do, do you mind popping over to the mic? Sorry. We're supposed to have people running over with the mics. Hmm. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah, Richard Dickinson. Uh, this location, is it in the town aquifer? That is a big concern of mine. So, Ellie, I, I don't know, I, I don't believe, so we have a watershed protection overlay district, and this, this property is outside of the watershed protection. But honestly, I thought all of the aquifer was down on 116 by the Warner Pit and, uh, and across the street by the Laurinaitis property. So can, can we definitively say that this is not in, over the aquifer? Yeah. We can definitively say no. The answer to your question is no. And also let's just add that th this regulation doesn't over supersede any of our other regulations in town. It's not like because this goes into effect all of a sudden they get to like bypass normal, you know, normal planning board processes and, and whatnot. This is just making things more restrictive. Um, and the big picture idea here, to sort of to answer those first two questions you ha had were, why are we doing this? If we don't do it, it's out of our hands. And someone can come and decide they want to put it on South Main Street. And we have to follow the, the state regulations. This just gives the town a little bit more control over where, when, how this gets done. It's about restriction, not about making it easier for these to go in in places like watersheds and that kind of thing. So it doesn't change any of our current regulations. It just adds this extra level of control the town would then have that otherwise we, we give that control up to the state and whatever they decide we have to go with. Yes. No. 
state. Thank you, Dana. Is it the state who's doing the collecting and redistributing? No, this, this, so the question was whether or not the state is the, uh, the, is, so this is entirely a private enterprise. This is a for-profit business. The folks are, are, are buying these battery storage units, buying power when it's cheap and selling it back. So it is not a state entity that is responsible for this. I think we have one more question in the back there. Um, Dana, I couldn't quite hear you. Is, first of all, is there any way, to shut this, any way to shut this blower off? The noise is really terrible. It's very hard to hear. I don't, I don't think we can turn that off at the moment, no. Okay. My question, I have a couple questions, Dana. Did you say in the beginning that these are going to be trucks up there? Uh, let, let me ask a couple questions. Um, so, um, is, will there be solar collectors, and then the trucks are going to be some kind of battery storage? And why can't we say no? Who, who, who is, if it's a private entity and we are a municipality, why can't we say no? Right. I love that spirit. Um, I, 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 I would love to say no, um, but the state of Massachusetts, the Attorney General's office, is interpreting um, battery storage as part of the uh, state's uh, openness to solar development. So they, they are not distinguishing between this battery storage and solar. And solar is a permitted use that we are, the state is encouraging. So your question about the trucks, I'm just trying to get you to visualize, it's not necessarily a truck, but it's the equivalent of uh, a tractor trailer box uh, that the batteries would be in. So a 40 or 50 foot uh, uh, container, the equivalent of what uh, would be uh, a tractor trailer truck. Also, if I can just add that this can be in conjunction with solar, but they're really two separate things, and, and if they are in conjunction, it's, not, it's more of a coincidence than it is anything else. This is not specifically storage for a solar you know, setup. This can be just, they, they, as Dana said, they put a couple of those big um, tractor trailer truck backs, not with the wheels, but just the back parts in a field somewhere, connect it to the, the grid, pull a bunch of power off during the middle of the night when it's cheap, and then in the middle of the day when, the, when the, the usage goes up and the price is up, they sell it back to the system. They're not generating any clean energy. They're not adding any solar. They're not doing anything. And yes, they can sometimes be on the same property and next to a solar facility, but that's more coincidence than it is anything else. Right. Those are two separate enterprises, two separate business models that, yes, sometimes do coexist. We're not talking about limiting the ability for people to do solar in town. We're not talking about limiting people's ability to be able to collect that solar in, in battery storage facilities. We're trying to avoid having these is very much just profit driven and the state considers them green and that's what Dana is saying is that the reason we can't outright outlaw them is because the state says no this is part of our green enterprise and as a state we get to decide what is and isn't considered green. I might disagree with the state on whether or not a facility that doesn't actually generate any power is actually part of the green solution. There is something to be said for you know load balancing and whatnot as being part of that solution. What we're trying to do is we're trying to say outside of solar as a standalone thing, what we don't want to have happen is next week a company comes in and says we want to come into town. If we don't have anything on the books, they can go by the state regulations. If the state regulation says, yeah, sure, no problem, put it wherever you want, we have no control over that and we're stuck with a solar power, not even a solar power, but like a big battery thing on South Main Street or Garage Road or somewhere where we may not necessarily want to have that. Um, there's noise issues with the humming from large high voltage lines and whatnot. Um, so again, I know it's being discussed in the context of solar, but I want us to be thinking about this as, yes, it could be with solar, but if we say no to this or if we regulate this, it doesn't preclude solar, it just precludes this particular type of storage, if that makes sense. Lauren, and then we'll get to you, Aaron. Lauren. I mean, and just to be clear, we're not saying that tomorrow these trucks are going to appear. This is if someone comes to town 
and proposes this business, you have the ability to say, well, only if it's over here. Right, so in terms of process, the way this works, any, any zoning change that the town of Sunderland uh, votes to adopt goes to the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General will review it and either say, yeah, you're within the law, or no, you're outside the law. That process usually takes two or three months. So it, it, it's likely that we might not hear from the Attorney General before July or August. Everything freezes once we had our public hearing back in December. So no, no developer can do anything until we hear back from the Attorney General. So does that answer your question? And then, then Aaron's got a question, too, after that. Okay. Kim Audette from Seven Hemlock Drive. Um, you mentioned the noise, and I know that's been a complaint in other places. Can we do anything to control that or regulate that? So our, our feeling on the planning board was by choosing the most remote uh, location of town where the furthest away from uh, residences uh, uh, there there are very uh, few up uh, along route 63 there's um, there are two gravel pits up there uh, the the power transmission lines um, cross uh, 63 uh, and uh, and go uh, through that area. So it just, it, it seemed like uh, the um, best location that we could, uh, we could propose. Um, we, to the extent uh, that we could control, so I think we say we, we do have um, uh, language in there about uh, any noise that the uh, use uh, creates can't project beyond a certain perimeter and I'm not a noise guy but uh, there's the, there's a decibel level that can't be exceeded beyond a certain distance and so um, w we have to the extent that we were allowed, we have tried to address that. Yes, thank you for your question. Aaron? Aaron Falbo, 422 Amherst Road. My question sort of expands on the last question. So according to your proposed use table, for a contractor to build one of these battery storage facilities in the C2 district, they have to apply for a special permit from the planning board. So my question is, what is the planning board looking for when one of these proposals comes into your purview? And under what circumstances can you deny this permit? What, uh, what ability do you have to say no, is what I'm asking. Wow, that's a great question. So as with any special permit, um, there are six criteria. Uh, that the special permit granting authority looks at and in some cases in this case the planning board would be the special permit granting authority in most cases in Sunderland it's the ZBA that's the special permit granting authority so there are six criteria neighborhood character and social structure uh, qualities of the environment yell them out there Steve traffic flow and safety Adequacy of utilities, neighborhood character and social structure, qualities of the natural environment. Impact on drinking water and recharge areas. So basically the way the process works, someone wants a special permit, they put their, uh, their application in, every abutter within 300 feet gets a certified letter that the planning board or the zoning board is going to be discussing this. The, the hearing is held. Anyone that has any concerns brings up their concerns. 
um, if the concerns, um, if, if in the opinion of the special permit granting authority, whether it's the planning board or the zoning board, if the opinion of the board is that the detrimental impacts outweigh the positive impacts, then the board would vote to deny the permit, the special permit. Uh, Larry Reve, North Plain Road. Sunderland, as you know, is a small town. Geographically, it's one of the very smallest in the state. And things that happen here have a big effect. That doesn't impress anybody in Boston. They have an idea that solar power is good, batteries are good, and all this stuff is good. All this stuff is good. It, it, they are in some ways, but the state has taken a, upon itself to just say, this stuff can go anywhere. We know what's best for you. I think this is a case where our planning board has looked at the reality of this situation and come up with a really good response that keeps within the law, within we hope within the purview of what the Attorney General is, is doing, basically by executive fiat. We can say it's not fair, but that doesn't count. What our planning board has done is come up with a very reasonable response to it that we can all stand behind. We can, it's, we can hope the Attorney General approves it, but they've done a great job of working to protect us in this case, and I think we should approve this. Any other questions on that article? Yep, Bob's got one. Bob Doobie, South Plain Road. Uh, every morning I've been discussing this issue with a member of the Hadley Planning Board because they've been dealing with trying to come up with something. And theirs was proposed for a spent gravel pit. And the spent gravel pit happened to be over the aquifer. And one of the things that they did is say, no, you cannot build one of these over the aquifer. You have to build it somewhere else. And Somebody raised the question of whether or not it was in our, our aquifer, and I was pleased to hear that this isn't going to be within our aquifer, but it's going to be in somebody's. The, <clears throat> the other thing that Hadley is concerned about is, what are the chemicals that go into these batteries for the storage of energy? And what happens if one of these things leaks? And I don't know whether it made it into their bylaw or not, but what they were considering is that each individual battery have to have a container, a containment unit, that if this thing spills somehow, I have no idea what they even look like or what they contain, that whatever fluids are going to be held within that individual container unit for that particular battery. And one of their concerns is that the chemicals that are in these batteries can be somewhat on the toxic side. And that's one of the things that they emphasize is, if it leaks, let's make sure we, can, we contain it. And I don't know whether or not your board considered that in your proposal. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Dean. I'm one of the members of the planning board. Um, if, you, if you look in the, uh, the proposed bylaw, there is a section um, when we go through the design and performance standards that we'd be requiring. Uh, there is a requirement that there be some provision for containment, um, whether there is some sort of pad or other secondary containment system that, that prevents any contact with the ground or, or, uh, um, or storm water or, or anything like that. So. I believe that we've addressed that in the best way that we can. Huh. Got a follow up? Go ahead. Uh, 
this one really isn't a serious question, but when the C2 district was proposed way back, the reason that it was proposed is it was going to be for adult entertainment. And I'm wondering how compatible this is with the <laughs> district. <laughs> I mean, those neon lights need to stay on somehow, so. <laughs> yeah, all right. <clears throat> Give a motion. Make a motion, we move Article 9. Second. All, all those, we have nope. a. One more question? Another question. I'm Ellie Kurth, I'm also on the planning board. I just wanted to add that we put in a required setback for um, water supply wells in the zoning bylaw. So um, the way we looked at it is like we, we needed to do something and so we thought secondary containment around the batteries and having a setback would at least give us time. Like if there was a fire and we're worried about firefighting chemicals, we know it's there and then we have time to react and respond and hopefully help whoever is served on a nearby private well. We have a second on that? Second. Okay. All right. All those in favor. Sorry, we have. Oh, is there another one question? One more question. One more question. Here. Yep. Steve? I'm Steve Kroll. I live on Old Amherst Road. I'm also the uh, chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, the likelihood of a uh, battery storage proposal coming to Sunderland is pretty high. Uh, a couple years ago, they were sniffing around, uh, making some requests. Uh, I, I, I spoke with Dean, I said, Who's, who's got authority over this? And he said, we really don't. So it is responsible for the town to have some bylaws protecting to the best of our ability, our ability to control and where this would be cited. Because if we don't, it's gonna, we, we have no protection whatsoever. Like uh, I think someone mentioned, they could put it on Main Street. Or they, I mean, so, I mean, this, it is important that this uh, bylaw get, get adopted. And uh, just for the protection of the town, uh, you know, the, 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 one of these is going to be coming. It's already coming in neighboring towns around. Uh, so it's, uh, it, would, it would behoove us to uh, pass this bylaw and at least have some control over our, our future. All right. Any other questions or comments on Article 9? All right. All those in favor of Article 9? All right. Anyone opposed? All right. Declared by a majority. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So two thirds then? Okay. All right. So that we did, just as an uh, FYI, for Articles 9 and 10, we will need a two-thirds majority on that one. So that one's declared by two-thirds. All right. Next article, Article 10. All right, and uh, Article 10 will also have to be two-thirds. <clears throat> Move that the town vote to amend Chapter 125 of the Code of Sunderland, zoning bylaws set forth in a document entitled Proposed Zoning Amendment ATM 2024, Structure Conversion on file with the town clerk with provisions to be inserted as shown in underlined text and provisions to be deleted shown in the strikethrough text. Do you want to give a little explanation on that one too, Dana, please? Okay, so what we're trying to do here um, is we have um, an underutilized piece of property 
uh, in town that I think we're all familiar with. Um, the Cozy Corner no Nursing Home uh, went out of business, um, uh, I'm going to say four or five years ago, maybe, maybe longer. Um, that um, is a use, a land use that is not permitted. So were another nursing home to, to locate there within two years, it would have been allowed, it would have been grandfathered. But once the two-year window expires, the grandfathering, the grandfathering provision um, expires with it. So um, there uh, is uh, a property owner uh, that is interested um, in developing that property. Um, and we have been working with that landowner uh, to try uh, and uh, bring that property back. Um, what this change would do is uh, currently, um, if you have a, a, a property in Sunderland uh, that was in existence in 1978, you can, you can petition uh, for a special permit to develop up to four residential units. Uh, you can do a structural conversion as long as you're not changing anything on the outside, you're not adding any exterior, new exterior doors, anything visible. Uh, what would be required, uh, you, you, would, you would come to the Zoning Board of the Planning Board for a special permit. Uh, so you would have to meet uh, those six criteria that we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, in addition, for each unit, uh, you would have to have uh, half of the required land. So if, for example, uh, the, uh, the minimum lot size was uh, 20,000 uh, square feet, you would need 10,000 additional square feet for each additional unit. So that's the way it is now. The, the change that we're proposing is to allow that four to expand to eight if the property owner has at least 10,000 square feet. So if the existing property is at least 10,000 square feet, then the landowner could petition for a special permit to develop eight residential units. So, the, yeah, the, the structure, so the dwelling is 10,000 square feet, not the entire property. So, if I can just get my cheat sheet here. So, I went to the assessor and asked the assessor to give me a list of all properties in Sunderland uh, in excess of 10,000 uh, square feet that were in existence prior to 1978. There are 33 properties uh, that this would impact. Of the 33, 27 are currently apartment structures with more than eight units. So that leaves us with um, six properties that would be impacted. Um, the six properties are uh, the Warner Brothers uh, office building uh, on 116, uh, the nursing home that we're talking about, uh, the uh, Dunkin' Donuts 7-Eleven uh, uh, Plaza, that entire plaza, uh, the uh, school, uh, at, or excuse me, the town hall uh, at 12 School Street, uh, the Allstate's asphalt uh, building uh, on 116, uh, and the um, church 
uh, at the far end of town used to be a tennis facility. Uh, right, the very last property on the right as you're leaving Sunderland. Those are the properties that would be impacted by this proposed change. So a very finite list, uh, and that our intention was not uh, to change uh, the bylaw. Our, our intention was to create an opportunity for a property owner to improve their property uh, with as little impact to the town as we could. So this is what we are proposing. If I could just add one thing, and it's that without this kind of a bylaw in place, they can still tear down the building and, and rebuild it. What we're talking about is allowing them to maintain the structure that currently exists and use it for a new purpose. Kind of think of it as recycling the building rather than having to completely tear it down. We felt that, and the like board, which is why we, or at least I felt, I should say, um, that this was a, a good way of being able to reuse a building that's in perfectly good shape for a new purpose rather than having to have the developer who will still put the eight units that he wants in just tear it all down, start from scratch. That's a lot worse ecologically, um, noise-wise for the town, for a whole bunch of reasons. So for, for me, that was the big thing that I thought was important to, to highlight is we're not talking about necessarily saying no one can use the Koji Corner's property or not. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about whether or not they can use that building as it stands or have to do a complete tear down and build it from the ground up. To be clear, I think it's a huge concession on the part of the landowner to agree with, with such a large uh, piece of property to agree to only uh, developing eight units. Um, I, I think uh, was a real win. There are over nine acres of land that are associated with this, so were he to tear the property down, we're going to see probably 10 or 12 single family. I mean, there's got to be some way that he can make his money back for the expense of tearing down and cleaning up that. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, that in, in terms of impact to the town, uh, that this would be the least impactful uh, 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 proposition for that property. Good question. Good question. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> I'm still Larry Reve from North Plain Road. Uh, to look at this as a, a change to our zoning bylaws brought about by one person looking at one piece of property. The bylaw as it's written would actually extend and include rural residential areas, which is not really appropriate. It's not such a expanded multifamily, and this bylaw requires the change of the definition of multi-family dwelling units. Um, and eight, such eight unit building is not really appropriate for a rural residential area. And further, raises the question of sanitation, the septic difficulties of any large building as uh, the town has found out, or any large uh, project that town found out in recent years is extremely troubling. Uh, town sewage is limited where it can go, and the state of the art on other forms of uh, septic is, is problematic to say the least. Such a, uh, the argument is that at this point, it doesn't matter because there aren't that many buildings in a rural residential right now that fall under this category. Be that as it may, we're here tonight considering changing the bylaws. That could happen in the future. That magic date of 1978 for building restrictions could be changed in the future. The 10,000 square feet could be changed in the future. A very simple change in the bylaw restricting this proposal to VC, uh, VR, and C1 would accomplish it. It could be done also by adding 
to the new language in section 125.2e, part two, which is being added here, just say, yeah, 10,000 square feet, blah, 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 in VR, VC, and V1. That would eliminate a great deal of the problems here. Similar things have been done for planned unit development. The planned unit development overlay says, yeah, you can do all this stuff, but the overlay is only in C1 and VC. It's not outlandish to do that, not complicated to do that. Uh, the point is that we aren't necessarily for one person coming to town and say, I want to do this with my lot, it's not allowed, change the law for me. We're changing the law, not just for that lot, but also for rural residential for which such a project is not appropriate. Uh, further, uh, this guy, this, the, the town and, uh, may have a point, thinks uh, this guy, this developer is being awfully nice, but he's getting an awful lot from the town as well. He's not providing any new affordable housing, which has been an issue. Right now the town has worked very hard and is safe under 40B, is a 40B uh, requirements, but all of us who like to see any new development include affordable housing to help protect uh, the town. So I think this is a potentially uh, problematic change being proposed that could be very easily made safe for the town just by limiting the zones in which it's allowed. Thank you. Do you mind if I respond to some of that? No. Um, so <laughs> we've had a lot of discussions about this, um, and the thinking was a couplefold. One, we've identified every property that could be. There's not going to be any properties that show up in town in the future that are over 10,000 feet and were built 40 years ago. That's not going to magically happen. There, we will never see another property in town suddenly become part of those requirements. So we know what the list is. The list was read. We're aware of what properties are. None of them do fall in residential areas anyways, so it's not really a starter for us in that respect. Um, and beyond that, we don't have control over what the developer does in terms of, let me say, this process doesn't have anything to do with our control over how the developer uses that land in terms of um, in terms of low-income housing, in terms of that kind of thing. What we're talking about is this very specific, narrow thing, which is can they use that property, can they use the building again, or do they have to tear it down? Um, it would be great if we would be able to have more control over things like the, you know, like low-income housing in town, and we do have some control, the state does have some control, but this isn't a discussion about that. Um, and I do understand your, your point of, well, yeah, well, we could change it down the line to be 5,000 square feet, or 2021 rather than 1978 but that would also require a meeting like this to require a change in the laws. And so basing this change on a potential change that could happen under the same circumstances seems like a non-starter for me as well. Um, so I understand the concerns, but uh, we're not talking about opening things up that are more, we're not talking about something that could be, could potentially open up further in the future. We're talking about something that, if anything, buildings are going to age out of this if they do get torn down. So let's say that the, the Cozy Corners does go a different direction and that building is torn down rather than being repurposed, that building is now no longer a structure that's been existing since 1979, and so we would see things over time coming off the, the potential roles rather than going on. Dana, did you want to add anything on that? Any other questions? Question. Tom? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my name is Tom Feitenkevitz, and I would ask the people in the audience, Tom Meeting, how many developers do you know that would do something nice to the town just because they want to do something nice? <laughs> Please raise your hand. <laughs> I don't see anybody raising a hand. We already do have a mechanism in town for development of that property that can be utilized right now, and it would take care of one of the most pressing needs in the Commonwealth, and that's affordable housing. These developers, and I don't know if it's the same ones, had come to the town before looking to develop that piece of property. A couple years ago, the town's position was Look, the town of Sunderland right now conforms with the 
10% of our housing as affordable, which, which allows a town the ability to deny Chapter 44 development. So 44B. But what we can do is we can use 44B in the friendly manner. 40B. Oh, that's fine, Jay. That's fine, Jay. Thank you. Which, which would allow the town to negotiate with the developer that could bring in affordable housing and other housing that would help the town. Now, right now, if you come in with eight, house, eight new dwelling units, those dwelling units will probably market rate, because I don't see anything in the proposal that would allow for affordable housing. The town could ask the developer to develop, as part of the project, affordable housing. Why wouldn't we want to do that? The 40B, a friendly 40B right now, is probably more expensive, just like any type of their development they're talking now. The only reason they want to do it the way they want are proposing right now is to save money. It's not addressing the affordable housing issues that we have, and it's not helping the people that need the help the most. It's helping one person, the developer. Any other questions or comments on Article 10? Yes. Phyllis Berman, North Plain Mode. Um, somebody said something about the nursing home. Be you just got a little I'm closer. Sorry. That's right. Um, somebody said something about the nursing home being in good condition. This was the nursing home where the um, the ceiling collapsed and they had to move out some of the nursing people. Um, it was built in 1953, which means it's full of asbestos. It's not a good building. And everybody knows it's not a good building. It's one of the reasons they haven't been able to do too much for it. Um, it's also, the nursing home is on a, um, a lot that's 0.7 acres. Somehow they've, because, just because they have an adjacent owner, they're giving it acreage, but the nursing home is on 0.7 acres. And um, they're, the added yellow house next door is a completely separate property. Although somehow the nursing home sticks into it, I'm not sure what the zoning was at the time. So I'm not sure if this is a good piece of property to um, try to save. And also for Tom, Fyde, and Kevitt, Sunderland has 40B under control right now. Something like this puts more units into a town that is more than 50% rental. Do we really need to put to put in more um, rental units. Um, and this does not do anything for affordable housing. Um, it actually makes it worse, like Tom Fyden and Kevitt said. So for there are many, many reasons that it shouldn't be done at all. But it, this, without saying specifically that it shouldn't be, it, that it is allowed in rural residential puts a strain on the septic systems and septic systems in the rural residential are failing all over town and there you could easily in this everybody says oh we only found this number of buildings so what put in specifically this is not going to go in rural residential and then nothing can happen in the future with this because it'll be in writing. In section E, number two, where it says a dwelling in existence, blah, 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 it could say in VR, VC, and C1, a dwelling, blah, blah, blah. And they're not doing that. And there's no reason not to do that. <clears throat> Steve? So I just want to clarify uh, that 
the, uh, the Cozy Corner Nursing Home and the Yellow House next door are a single property. There, there is a lot line that does bisect one, uh, a, a portion of the property. It, it is, in the planning board's view, one proposal, one property, the yellow structure and the nursing home, eight units for the, the yellow house and combined. That it is one nine acre parcel, same owner, owns the entire thing. So the 0.7 in the planning board's view is irrelevant. Steve, did you have a question? <laughs> Steve Kroll, 77 Old Amherst Road, Chairman of the Zoning Board. Against my better judgment, I'm going to try to come up here and approach this. I'm going to try to approach this from a different direction. The property at Cozy Corner, due to uh, what it is and the district it is in, is a useless derelict property. Property, like Dana said, uh, if someone came in uh, within two years after the uh, cozy corner went out of business, they could put a nursing home in, the, home in there. But the two years lapsed, that's gone. If someone wanted to come in and put a nursing home in there now, it wouldn't be allowed. It's caught up in a zoning quagmire. This proposal, uh, and I'll, I'll say that, uh, I'm also a, uh, a butter there, so I have an interest in it myself. But uh, the owner of that property has come before the, the planning board, or has come to the town, in wanting to do something with this property. And every proposal that he wanted to do would have involved, he said, want to do a 40B? I says, I need 75 units to make it economically feasible. He said, no. He wanted to build up the property. We said, no, it, it's not allowed. This latest proposal, to take the existing structure and put it in eight units is is the best is the best proposal for the town and for the property and for the neighborhood. It would allow a property right now that's disintegrating to be put back on the uh, on the tax uh, tax maps and would allow a use that would look from the outside very much like the Cozy Corner did when it was in operation. <coughs> now, uh, I've heard a lot of comments about what if, what if, you know, could something else happen here? I'll simplify this for you. The structure conversion bylaw has been in place in this town since probably the 80s. And being on the zoning board, we've only had a handful of people that wanted to take their structures and turn them into two or multifamily units. It's not something that a developer is gonna come in and take advantage of, and it is very restrictive. And this change to allow up to eight units into this uh, in, in, uh, in, in, into this bylaw is an avenue to make the best possible deal for the town for this property. Like Dana said, this is I, this is a good deal for the town. They, the the property, there's 10 acres or there's nine plus acres of property there. If they knock down that property, they could put a whole bunch of single family houses in there. 
and that would have a bigger impact, impact on the town and on the, uh, the neighborhood. I mean, it's the, I mean the, the fear that structure conversions are going to pop up all over the place in the rural residential district, and it's going to be, you know, there's it's going to be uh, issues with septic systems and all that. This bylaw, as it is right now, is very restrictive. It says, uh, this is uh, currently in there. <laughs> This is part of the bylaw right now, is number three. Any dwelling units must be served by town sewage or on a newly system meeting Title V. This property is on the town sewer. So, I mean, if you're worried about suddenly all sorts of people coming and converting their structures to take advantage of this, it's not gonna happen. Because one of the first things it says, you can't have any exterior changes. So everything is going to be, all the changes to this property are interior. Um, uh, you know, it, it, you know it, and, and Tom was talking about trying to roll it into some for, sort of uh, affordable housing. It doesn't work. We explored that with the, de with the developer. Because in order to put up affordable housing, it's going to be economically viable for them. And in order to be economically viable, they need a lot more than eight units, a ton more. So, so um, ju just to cut to the chase, I, I, I don't think, I, I, this is a, a, a good deal. It's, it's, you're overanalyzing it, worrying about what if, what if, what if? This is a pretty simple change that allows a, a property that is not in use and actually starting to be derelict and to bring it in and provide some housing. Uh, does anybody have any new ground to plow with this one? Yeah. All right. Just briefly only if it's a, a new topic on it. Yep. Appreciate that. And, and just a, a quick response. Uh, fear of things popping up or fear of terrible things, that's what good planners do for a living, is they try to anticipate problems. I make no apology for that. Um, and it's true that the bylaw states uh, town sewer or something approved by the state. Things approved by the state is what I'm referring to saying this is, this state of the art is not what we would like it to be in terms of sanitation, chapter five. And the failing systems throughout town, we all know about $35,000, someone we know in town had to pay to sell their house to bring things up to title five. Yeah, the new, uh, in, in the south end of town, yeah, yeah. development there has put in their private yeah. system not looking for trouble, but you can expect, uh, would not be surprised to see um, problems with that and others in the future. And uh, I certainly agree that it's a good thing that Cozy Connor is on, on town sewer and keeping such things within VR, VC and C1 would help that to any possible, would, would keep that in any possible development in the future. All right, we ready to move article 10? Motion that we move on. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor of Article 10? Uh, and any opposed? There you go. Okay. Declare by two thirds. <clears throat> Article 11. Move that the town vote. <clears throat> Excuse me. Move that the town vote pursuant to the provisions of General Laws Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, as most recently amended to establish FY 2025 fiscal year spending limits for the revolving funds listed in Section 35-6 of the General Bylaws, and to authorize such expenditure limits to remain in place from fiscal year to fiscal year, unless revised by the town meeting prior to July 1st for the ensuing fiscal year, as follows. And this is basically for the revolving Involving fund limits, we do this each year. Anybody have any questions on this one? 
I motion we move Article 11. We have a second. Second. All those in favor of Article 11. Uh, opposed? All right. Unanimous on Article 11. Article 12, this is a citizen's petition, and we're going to have a few um, students come up and speak for this one. The article, move that the town vote to authorize the select board to petition the general court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to enact legislation in substantially the form below to grant the town of Sunderland the authority to endow legal voting rights in municipal elections for the town of Sunderland residents aged 16 and 17 years old, and further that the select board be authorized to approve amendments to said by the <clears throat> said act by the general court before its enactment that are within the scope of the general objectives of this motion. Does anybody have any, um, any explanation of how they want to? Okay. I motion we move Article 12. Second. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, Jess, do you want to give a little thing or do you want me to give a? Okay. Please take it away. Wasn't sure if you had any other comments. Nope. All right. Hello. My name is Josie. Uh, I live in Sunderland and we are seventh graders at Frontier. I am one of the students who worked on the citizens' petition to lower the voting age to 16, along with other friends and adults. We have gathered signatures to put the issue on the town meeting warrant for Sunderland, Deerfield, Conway, and Whateley. Oh, God. Hello, my name is Jimin. We think that giving voting rights to 16 and 17 year olds would be, oh, thank you. <laughs> would be good for everyone because it would get us in the habit of voting before we get even busier, making it more likely that we will vote consistently as adults. We would get to learn more about town politics and town meetings while we still live in our home communities where we already care about the issues around us. Letting 16 and 17 year olds vote would help increase overall participation in town elections because there would be more people and they would be younger, which can help them make better decisions in the future. Hi, my name is Araceli. I know that some people think that 16 is too young to be responsible enough to vote. I wonder if you believe that every 18 year old is too responsible enough. What about 25 year olds? Knowledge and experience are not requirements for voting eligibility. 16-year-olds have many adult rights in Massachusetts, including working a full-time job, paying taxes, getting married, <coughs> driving a car, and owning and, to and running a business. They are subjected to all of the laws, but have no say in making them. If this article passes, our select board will, act, will ask Natalie Blay and Joe Comerford to file a home rule petition with the state legislature, which must be approved before 16 and 17 year olds can actually start voting here. Other towns and cities have started similar petitions without a response, and they hope that adding our four frontier regional towns to this group will, for will force the legislature to act in other words, the town of Sunderland could eventually be one of the reasons that teenagers in Boston, Lowell, Cambridge, Brooklyn, Southboro, and Northampton get to vote in their own municipal elections. Please vote yes on this article to build on current and future democratic engagement in Sunderland and beyond. Thank you. <laughs> Please, Jess. Uh, Jessica Corwin, North Silver Lane, and I'm the chair of the uh, elementary school committee. Um, in my school committee capacity, I'd like to say that the uh, joint school committees on April 9th passed a resolution supporting this article um, that we believe this would enhance the education we are offering to our students to give them this real life experience of participating in local politics. Um, it was passed by uh, four of the five school committees. Conway did not have a quorum, but Sunderland, Deerfield, Waitley, and Frontier School Committees all supported this. Um, I had the joy of working with these kids on this project this year. It was more than just these three, um, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions. How many, I, I don't know how many 16-year-olds we have in Sunderland. I don't remember the exact number, but I think we figured out that it was 36 or something. Yeah, 44. 44. 44. 44. So not, no, not talking about hundreds and hundreds of kids here. 
Right, but also it, if we pass this tonight, it's going to take some time, potentially years, before the state legislature will approve it. So the number of 16-year-olds we have this year actually isn't relevant. <laughs> Yeah, a few dozen, it seems likely. Why not make it 10-year-olds? Because in Massachusetts, 16-year-olds have some specific adult rights that 10-year-olds don't, including working and paying taxes. Yep, get one there, and then we'll get one in the back. Yes. Yes, they would be able to vote for their own school committee representatives. But they would not be able to vote in state or federal elections. This would only be for town elections and town meetings. Yes, over there. Could, would you mind yeah. just He's asking, come up could, yeah. could anybody eligible to vote run for office because until the age of 18, you can't legally sign a, a, a legally binding document? They would not be able to run for office until they are 18. I think, was there one in the back also? Yes. Yep. Hello, John Corpita, Russell Street. Um, I just want to say I'm opposed to this for the simple reason that it allows non-tax paying citizens to vote for articles that affect tax-paying citizens. So they would have the ability to raise you know, uh, taxes uh, to other people that are um, you know, in town, how, um, homeowners and, and uh, um, landowners to, that, that are paying taxes. So they don't, they're, you said they take, pay taxes, but it, well, I imagine you're talking about um, payroll taxes and stuff, if they get a job. But they're not paying. Um, they're not paying uh, real estate taxes in the town of Sunderland. So I oppose to that. I, I'm a, I, I, I think it could be that they could come to um, meetings and participate. But I would put uh, a limit on. Uh, they could. They could make suggestions. But as far as voting goes, no. Thank you. I, I hear that. Um, if I can respectfully poke back at it a little bit, um, we do have 16-year-olds who work jobs to make household contributions, which is an indirect way of paying property taxes if their parents are paying the property taxes and they're, they're, hand, they're giving money to their parents from the jobs they're working. And also, we do already have residents who can vote who don't pay taxes uh, because of the conditions on their affordable housing. And I'll also add that if you had a house that had four adults living in it, that's four people who can come and vote. If you have a house with two adults and two 16-year-olds or a 16 and 17-year-old, same four people living in the same house, same property taxes across the board. It, it's, it's, you know, it, we, we, don't, we don't charge every adult in Sunderland taxes based on how many adults live in the house. We base, base it on the property. So who's living in the property really doesn't, doesn't speak to where that money's coming from and, and the, the money there. Um, and if I can just add, a lot of young people, their first experience of voting is when they leave their hometown and go off to college. And so this gives students an opportunity to have a couple of experiences in town where they're more comfortable, where they have the guidance of their parents, where they have the guidance of, of, of other adults to be able to get that experience before their only guidance is their classmates at UMass or wherever. This gives people that ability to get that initial civic experience. It also allows us to have the teachers in town, both at Frontier and at Franklin Tech and at, even at the elementary level, start to do civics lessons that have the ability to lead up to actually putting those into practice because civics is great in theory, but if you know that at the end of this this year or the end of the next year when you turn 16, you have the ability to put that into practice, everybody takes things they learn more seriously if they have that ability to act on it in the future. And so for me, this aside from all of the, the issues that we might want to discuss about legality and about things like taxes and whatnot, the driving force behind this for me is getting civic engagement. And if we look around this room, the average age in this room is not 16 years old, 
and we have struggled in town, and I say this from experience of somebody who, we struggle to find people who want to be involved civically in town, getting people to town meetings, getting people to vote, getting people to volunteer to run for boards like this. If we get a 16-year-old interested at 16, when they hit 22, they might want to run for planning board, and that would be wonderful for our town to see new blood in, in politics, new blood in these things. I cannot tell you the last time we even had a contested <laughs> contested run in town because there's so little civic engagement and I, I know this may not be everyone's favorite place to increase that civic engagement, but it is some place we can, and we have young people who are willing to come here today to do this, so there obviously is interest amongst young people to be civically engaged, and what better way to bring more people into local government, of which I'm so passionate about, than to have people who are already on that cusp get that little bit of experience before they move in to being full-on adults. Um, you know, I don't love the whole yeah, 17 and a half, you're a kid, and at 18 all of a sudden you're an adult, and all of a sudden everything's supposed to change. It's kind of like a speed limit. If the speed limit goes from 30 down to 45, you need a little bit of time to slow down. You don't want to have to go right as you get to the speed limit sign. This gives some of that lead up time to our young people to be able to get a feel for it in a controlled environment. And as just said, this is not state and federal elections. We're not talking about 16-year-olds being able to vote for president. We're talking about whether or not they can have a say in who represents their school's interest in the school board, who represents their town, who gets to be part of their planning boards and whatnot. Thank you. So, one question here, Scott, and then I'll get to you, and then you in the back there. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. I would suggest that the minimum uh, requirement for participation is walking to a ballot box and voting. I would echo John's point about the ability. Hey, hey, how about that? <laughs> the, the ability. So I, I would, I would, I would suggest that the bare minimum for participation is being able to go to a ballot box. There weren't in my tenure here many 16-year-olds showing up to town meeting, which is something that's truly educational not something that can be parroted from either a parent or from another organization or from social media to go and simply vote yes or no on. That's my opinion. Secondly, if you really wanted to encourage that involvement, where is everybody's kids right now? You're at an annual town meeting. We had people come up, and I respect the fact they came up and put their position forward, but it was for one article. I think, did, did, was there a question over here? And then we'll get to you in the back. And I think Val had a question. <clears throat> um, first, I want to say that I support this, but I do have a question. Um, my question is, um, because it would be for municipal elections, what happens if there's some kind of confusion that names or registrations or something, and I don't know if this has happened, uh, get mixed up so that names are going to be for state or federal elections? So, I, if I can start with, the, the wording of this specifically says that there's going to be a separate role being kept of the 16 and 17 year olds, so that it's two different documents so it's, it's built into the wording of this to, pre to prevent that kind of scenario from happening so that somehow a name would have to get off of one role and the other one, which, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a, a risk that already exists just in general if someone accidentally getting put in the wrong role. Um, but that, that wording is, is explicitly in there to, to try to account for that. So if some kind of confusion happened, we would back up our town clerk that she wasn't trying to pull something over our eyes. I mean, the same as if someone in town wasn't eligible to vote and accidentally got eligible. You know. <laughs> yes, no, we would definitely back up our, yep. our lovely Wendy, yes. Okay, last thing is, let's have an applause for students who want to vote. <laughs> yep, one question Civic in the back. engagement. Yep, I got you. And then we got a gentleman in the back there after you. Um, I also applaud students who want to vote, students who want to participate in democracy, which, as you can see, sometimes is a little messy, people have said it, and difficult. Um, and it involves things that uh, cost your neighbors money and affect whether perhaps they can keep their in-laws on their property and how much they can give for their houses and all of their things. Uh, and sales, it it's, has a lot of effect on people. 
I applaud anyone, uh, the young people who want to know more about it and be involved. And I understand and value new ideas, fresh ideas, a way of looking at, at things that us old folks don't have. But this isn't the place to learn it. Casting a vote is not a classroom activity. We are looking for voters who have experience, who have come to a bunch of meetings and looked at it and say, I, I can do this better. But, no, but a town meeting is, is not a classroom exercise, it shouldn't be. And I think the ages that we have now are painful for some, but they're quite reasonable and should be kept. So they should only come to town meeting when they've already come to town meeting and have experience? Is that what you just said? Yeah. So people should only be allowed to vote at town meeting when they've observed previous town meetings. Okay. 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 We have are we, any other questions? Yes. Chris Tajiri in South Plain Road. Um, quick question, I'm not sure who to address it to, but uh, do legal permanent residents, i.e. people who do have, uh, who do pay taxes, who have residency in the United States but are not U.S. citizens due to whatever reason, um, do they have the, the right to vote locally here? Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes, Keith. I'm Keith McFarland, uh, Old Amherst Road. I'm on the Frontier School Committee. I supported this. Uh, I believe in expanding civic engagement in any way possible. We have residents in town who are not property owners who vote in every election. Uh, we have uh, 80 to 90 percent of eligible voters in town not here that don't participate. Uh, I trust our young adults to make the right decision. Um, uh, both of my children would like to be involved. Uh, at 16 years old, they are contributing to our town. They're driving, they are legal residents. Um, this is something that I think is important and I, I, I would support this. This is not something that's gonna take effect immediately. If we, this vote asks the town to petition for the right for 16 year olds and up to vote, it does, we're not gonna have 16 year olds voting tomorrow. Uh, it, it would take several years. I just think it's really important to engage uh, the young adults in our town to be involved. If we pass this, perhaps we may see more young adults here next year, and I think it's really important. And again, I look around this room, I, I feel like this is one of the smallest, out, uh, um, smallest uh, number of people I've seen come out in, in several years. And again, 80 to 90 percent of our eligible voters are not here, so any opportunity to expand civic participation and voting is important. If I can also just add that, you know, there's no guarantee that when someone turns 18 that they suddenly become an informed voter. And if we are concerned about 16-year-olds voting uninformed, I mean, we should also be concerned about 18-year-olds voting informed and 25-year-olds and 82-year-olds voting uninformed. That's not something that we are able to control or regulate, nor should we. Um, and, you know, you make a good point that we don't see a lot of 16-year-olds here at town meeting which means that we're not expecting 44 16-year-olds to show up every single time. But if there are three or four 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds in town who have an interest, as evidenced by them being here today asking for this, letting those three or four who really want to be involved, to me, is, is more important than the 18-year-olds who don't want to be involved. You know, we're, we're talking about people who do want to be involved, who do want to show up. I don't imagine that next year we're all of a sudden going to have the same number of people here plus 44, not next year, but a couple years down, plus 44 kids here. You know, <laughs> I can't get my kids to come and I'm on the select board. So, you know, we're not talking about all of a sudden all of them are going to start showing up and take over town and start, you know, voting everything. We're, we're 
I would be very ple pleasantly surprised if we got five people per year under the age of 18 to come out to these elections, but that's five more people who are civically engaged than we would have otherwise. It's not going to make a huge swing in terms of things like overrides and whatnot. I know there's concern that people are going to, like, the, you know, parents are all going to bring their kids out to vote. I can't get my kids to clean their room. I definitely would have a hard time getting them to even come out to vote. But if they were interested, as evidenced by these young folks here who are wanting to come out and wanting to be involved, who are we to tell them that they can't be involved in that? Thank you. We have one more question from up here, and then I'll get to you, Peter. Yeah. Here, do you want this one? Just go ahead. I love the debate. Um, I wonder if the concerns are how we're getting people, young people, 16 and 17 year olds, engaged. Maybe. I, I believe that this involves classes at Frontier where the kids are being educated in a civics, I'm assuming because this is only locally, for local issues and elections, that maybe we could start that going now um, and then revisit it so that everyone can see how much it does affect that age group and if they're, you know, how willing they are to participate. When the school committees were considering our resolution in support of this, we did hear from members of the social studies department who were all strongly in favor. Yeah, and it would be nice to, to see, I guess what I'm saying is, is if you're weary about the people who are weary about um, that age group voting, why can't we put that first at the school so then they can see? And I'm assuming with that education, kids will be coming to town meetings and select boards meetings, and they're gonna know what's going on in the town, which to me is a win. Peter? My name is Peter Lacey. Um, I support this. I, I don't know how, obviously how the vote would go, but I would encourage everybody who is concerned about it, if it should pass, to talk to all your neighbors and have them show up so that if you're worried about a handful of 16-year-olds raising your taxes, you, you know, have your neighbors be here in larger numbers than as you see they are. Um, we need more people to vote everywhere, all ages. And you know, if you're worried about it, talk to your adult neighbors and have them come on out. Peter. Uh, Peter Gagarin, North Main Street. Uh, this is 63 years too late to do me any good. <laughs> But I'm going to vote for it anyway, because I think it's a good idea, and I think it moves us in the right direction. All right. Are we ready to move Article 12? All right. All those in favor? Well, we actually need a motion. Yeah. Move. Yeah. Motion to move Article 12. Second. All those in favor of Article 12? All right. And then the nose, all, all no's. Keep your nose up there. OK. All right. Declared by a majority. All right, our next batch of articles are what's called our consent articles, and we usually vote those in the block. Those will be articles 13 through 18. Anyone have any questions on those before we go? Yeah. All right. I move we, uh, sorry, I motion we move articles 13 through 18. Second. All those in favor of the consent articles 13 through 18, and these help us basically do our jobs in town here. All right. All those opposed? All right. That is declared unanimous. Um, just one quick thing. The library is going to be celebrating their 20th anniversary tomorrow from 12 to 2, and the Graves uh, building will also be open from 10 to 12. And... We have one more thing. We'd like to ask the town clerk to come up and read the election warrant, because that's coming up.
I move that the meeting adjourn to meet in the polling place in the community room at the Sunderland Public Library, 20 School Street in Sunderland on Saturday, the fourth day of May, 2024, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. to act on the following. Offices, Assessor, Select Board, Board of Health, Library, Trustees, Moderator, Planning Board, Riverside Cemetery, and Sunderland Elementary School Committee. And upon closure of the polls, to dissolve. Can you second it? Can you second it? Yep. Yeah. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. <clears throat> and then I'd like to ask for one more thing for a motion to adjourn, to dissolve no, the... No, no, no. We just, we just did it. That was just... Oh. All right. All those in favor? No. Aye. All right. And then we're... Uh, anyone against that? All right. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you for coming out.